Hello. Since almost four billion years, nature is constantly improving our biology, but it's doing this via a very harsh and brutal optimization process. If you are not well adapted, you either have to die young or, perhaps even worse, nobody wants to fuck you. <laughs> Evolution, the process that is currently optimizing us, is a very brutal and inhumane process because it's predicated on the necessity of the weak ones to die. The reason we have a functional immune system is because in the past enough people died from trivial infections. Our traits are built on mountains of corpses. Richard Dawkins uh, called the genome the genetic book of the dead because you can see genes as kind of adaptions to the ancient worlds that our ancestors were inhabiting. But of course, our modern environment is very different. And some of the things that might have been very well adapted in these ancient times in the savanna in small groups might not be very efficient or helpful nowadays. For example, our urge for high caloric food, it made a lot of sense in the past, but it's also the reason why nowadays sugar kills more people than gunpowder. So, we could ask whether we could do this optimization process better or maybe even more humane than nature does. I'm a geneticist, I've recently published a book on human optimization and one of the first things you have to accept when talking about optimization is that it's super hard to strictly define what constitutes an optimization and what not, right? But I will use a very weak definition. When I say optimization, I more or less speak about genetic alterations that seem interesting to us, right? So, and with this way, we are able to talk about this issue. So, if we talk about genetic alterations, the first question we have to ask is which of our traits are actually affected by genetics? Well, there are various kinds of studies one can do to figure this out, but the oldest method is what's called twin studies. You know, they're monozygotic and dizygotic twins. We know how genetically different they are. We know that both kinds roughly grow up in the same kind of environment, so this allows us to roughly separate genetics from environment, right? People are doing these studies for about 15, uh, 50 years. And recently, 2015, a massive meta-analysis was published combining all the data that was collected over this period of time. They compiled the data of about 3,000 scientific studies, including 15 million twin pairs to check the heritability of around 18,000 human traits. And what they found was that there is not a single biological trait that we know of that is not affected by genetics. All human traits are heritable to a certain degree. Right? Of course, there's massive differences uh, between the traits and their heritability, but there's not a single one that we know of that would be independent of your genetics. So here's one thing. At no point will I argue that we should now go out and change human biology, whatever, especially not at this point in time. But my job here is to speak about what is currently possible what is not possible, and what will soon be possible. So, uh, if we, let's say, we decide to change human biology, what can we actually do? Well, first we have to know whether we're talking about genetically altering adults or embryos, 
Altering adults is much harder, you know? You guys, uh, you have a lot of cells. Your body consists of around 3.5 trillion cells. And the truth is we don't have a method at this moment to change the genetics of so many cells at one time. But there are kinds of alterations that could be done and could considered, uh, be considered optimization that wouldn't require your whole organism to change. So usually what geneticists do if they want to change genetics of an adult organism is they use viruses. We use those viruses as transport vehicles for the genetic sequences or constructs that we want to insert into the cells, right? So what could we actually do? Um, one of the simplest things we could do that could be considered an optimization is to make people stronger, right? And, and you can discuss whether this is an optimization because, you know, it's definitely not an optimization regarding your ecological footprint. If you're very strong, you probably need to consume more calories. But it could be considered an optimization uh, concerning your ability to punch someone in the face. So this is something we could talk about. Now, there is a gene and it's called myostatin. And its role in the organism is mostly to inhibit over-proliferation of muscle cells, overshooting muscle growth. And we know that if we take this gene out, animals become super strong. For example, this is the picture of a regular mouse. Well, so it's not absolutely, of course it's peeled, but this is a normal mouse, right? It's, <laughs> you know those mice. So if you take out their myostatin gene, this is what they look like. This is not zoomed in, it's the same magnification. It's just that the one on the right has double the amount of muscle mass, right? That's also why myostatin is called the muscle mouse gene, because this is where it was mostly described in. But this doesn't only happen in a lab environment. For example, there was uh, at one point a spontaneous mutation in cattle, which made it very strong in this myostatin gene, and people consciously propagated this genetic um, mutation so, so they could establish a breed of cattle that just has a shitload of meat and it's called the Belgian Blue. Now this could be used on adults too because there have already been viruses created that can not really destroy but, but inhibit your myostatin gene, you know, and they were uh, packed into viruses and when injected into the legs of monkeys, those legs grow super strong and massive without them having to do any training and without regular doping tests being able to find them, which is quite a benefit. So what else could you do? I mean, you could, uh, you could increase endurance, for example, uh, there was a study done with mice. They infected them with a virus carrying a gene for EPO, building erythropoietin, which increases the amount of red blood cells in the body. And the endurance of those mice actually shot up. You know? and, and this is not really science fiction. This would also work in humans. And there is even a, a very successful German athletics trainer or well, let's say a former successful athletics trainer, well, because he went to jail um, for, for several doping-related issues, but, you know, on his computer they found emails writing to those research groups, you know, could we have some of those viruses maybe you know, for private consumption? So there are people trying to get onto those things, and you could ask, okay, those are professional athletes, they're crazy to begin with, would any normal people be willing to take such a risk? Because, of course, um, that's not like, I don't know, taking ibuprofen. Those are, those are massive interventions. And probably the answer is there would be enough people willing to do such an alteration. I mean, 
there is actually a very well researched sport psychological phenomenon that is called the Goldman dilemma, right? It's named after Bob Goldman. He was a physician which in the 90s did series of experiments where he tried to find an answer to the following question. What percentage of top athletes would be willing to consume an experimental drug if they knew, well, an experimental drug that would guarantee them to win Olympic gold, if they knew that the side effect would be that within 50, no, sorry, five years, they would die. And what he repeatedly found was that about 50% of those athletes would be willing to do this, right? So this might sound crazy, but it's, but it's not so crazy if you think about it properly, because you don't just stumble into Olympic Games. Those are mostly people who trained all their life to reach this one goal, right? They already made all those sacrifices, their health, their, their you know, social life, etc. And if, if you think what top athletes do nowadays, it's not so different, right? It's not uncommon for strength athletes who do doping to die of a thickened hard muscle. And, and I've seen a documentary about uh, endurance athletes that got busted for uh, doping. And, you know, one of them said they had to routinely set an alarm clock to the middle of the night. If you're in, <laughs> just wanted, wanted to say the good thing about being an Austrian is that we have a very loud and scary voice to begin with. Um, so they set an alarm clock to the middle of the night to jog around in their hotel room because all the red blood cells made their blood so thick that if the heart would pump with such a low rate as it does at night for an extended period of time, they might just die. So, so this is not so very different. There were um, follow-up studies looking into what percentage of the general population would be willing to um, take the same risk for extraordinary success in business. And here they found that around 1% of people would be willing to do this. But 1% yeah, is a lot, right? If we talk about Bulgaria, 1% would still be 70,000 crazy people. I always thought if they had done this study in my hometown, Vienna, probably most people would have answered, I give you 1,000 euros if it kills me immediately. <laughs> probably that's why those studies usually come from the US. <laughs> so, it's much simpler if you want to do genetic modifications on embryos, because embryos, if you start early enough, they only consist of one single cell. And we actually have very nice tools to precisely edit single cells. Nowadays, for example, um, you might have heard of what is often referred to as a genetic scissor called CRISPR. The original version was called CRISPR-Cas9. It was published not even a decade ago, and uh, it made it very easy, cheap, and precise to edit genomes. I've worked with CRISPR for several years, and yes, it really is that simple. And it constantly gets developed further. So the CRISPR of today usually is way more precise and better than the CRISPR of three months ago. Actually, the latest version was published only 20 days ago. It's called prime editing, and it's said to be able to correct for up to or almost 90% of all human heritable diseases. And you can buy it on the internet for $65. Well, uh, genome editing being so simple nowadays, of course, it didn't take a lot of time 
until the first designer babies showed up, right? If you haven't heard about CRISPR by itself, you have heard about it indirectly last year when uh, two Chinese babies were born that were said to have been genetically altered, consciously, which is true. They're nicknamed uh, Nana and Lulu. It was an attempt to cut out a gene that is called CCR5. And we know that if you take out CCR5, those people cannot be infected with HIV. So they can't get AIDS, right? We know this because 1% of the European population doesn't have functional CCR5 by spontaneous mutation, and they can't get AIDS, all right? I wouldn't speculate on it in the after party, <laughs> but 1% of you probably can't get AIDS. Um, anyways, you know, this sounded like a lame excuse, because honestly, why would you choose this one gene? The truth is, if you live in a developed nation, and you're careful, it's not so difficult to not get AIDS. And even if you're unlucky and you happen to catch it, medication is very good. People can live a very good long life, exactly as long as everyone else. So why choose this gene? Now, there is speculation that there might have been other motivations behind this choice. Um, but keep in mind, it's speculative. But in 2016, a paper was published where it was shown that if you remove CCR5 from the genome of mice, their cognition improves. Some aspects of their cognition. For example, they get better memory. And there was a very recent paper where they've shown that those people with a spontaneous CCR5 mutation, they have a higher uh, neuroplasticity throughout their life, right? And when they have brain damage, when they have brain trauma, they gain their mental capacities faster than those without this mutation, right? So there is the speculation that, and, and sorry, we know that this researcher who made those two designer babies, uh, he knew about the 2016 paper. Although, of course, he says this had nothing to do with his motivation, but he must have been aware that it alters something in the brain, right? And actually, this was always um, one of the horror scenarios that people were portraying since the moment people were talking about designer babies, that this could lead to some form of cognitive arms race superpowers, right? Because if you, had, if you had to change one of your traits, you would be best off with intelligence, right? I said in the beginning that it's very hard to define what constitutes an optimization. And one of the many reasons is that uh, our environment constantly changes. And what's best fitted now is probably not best fitted 20 years down the road. So one might argue that the one alteration that most likely could be considered optimization is that which allows you to rapidly adapt to new circumstances. And the trait that allows you to do this is in fact intelligence. Intelligence is the one trait where it's very hard to imagine a situation where, from your perspective, less intelligence is better than high intelligence, as you can imagine. So, let's do it. Intelligence. Now, when I, when I started to write this book about optimization, I was holding a belief that is actually fairly widespread uh, in the population. I thought that intelligence tests hardly measure anything than how good you are in taking intelligence tests. Turned out I was wrong. Well, intelligence tests, such as a good standardized IQ test, are actually fairly good predictors for many things that we associate with a good and successful life, like your future income, your probability of getting divorced, your likelihood of becoming a smoker, and 
so on. The, the, the truth is there are a million things that should be said about intelligence and intelligence tests, but this would take, uh, this would take way too much time. So instead, I will focus on one specific kind of experiment. So you can roughly measure how exhausting something is for the brain, how hard it has to work by measuring the brain's glucose consumption in a PET scan, right? Um, this was, for example, done in this experiment. What you see on the left is the brain of a person that plays Tetris for the very first time. Now, two things happen if you pay Tetris for the very first time. Um, first, your high score will suck. So your results will be terrible. You won't have good outcome. But also, it is super stressful. You really have to exhaust yourself, pay very close conscious attention. What you see on the right is the brain of a person that has played Tetris many, many times. And here the difference is, they have way better outcomes, way better results in Tetris, and at the same time, their brain does not have to exhaust themselves. Okay, so it comes easy for them. For them, it's more like a flow state. Now, you can do a very similar experiment. You take people who have never done an intelligence test, and you give them intelligence tests, yeah? So they're all unpracticed in this kind of stuff. Um, now, you will see some of them will have a high score, some of them will have a low score, and everything in between. Now, one thing you could expect is that those who have the high scores on this test are those who put most effort in, right? Who exhausted their brains the most. But that's not what you find. What you find is the opposite. Those whose brains work really hard on solving those problems are those with the low scores. The ones that have the high test scores, they are the ones whose brains, they were chilling. For them, it was easy, right? So there are brains that are just more efficient in solving complex problems, in doing complex tasks. And, uh, and this is also a predictor to a certain degree for other outcomes that we associate with high intelligence. So intelligence is a real phenomenon, and to a certain degree, it can be measured. All right, but is it heritable? Now, again, there are a lot of studies that you can do. You can do twin studies that we've already mentioned. You can do adoption studies, and you can do genetic studies. And the cool thing is, all of them come to the same conclusion. The heritability of intelligence is between 20 and 80 percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're laughing. That sounds like, yeah, it's somewhere between zero and 100 percent. No, that's not... <laughs> that is not what it means. There is... <laughs> Actually, it's very precise. There is, there is one... <laughs> it is, Jesus. It is one... There is one factor that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is age. If I measure the heritability of intelligence in very young people, you get estimates of about 20% heritability. If I measure very old people, you get measurements of, of about 80%. Heritability, right? Now, this sounds counterintuitive, <coughs> counterintuitive, but bear with me. Actually, there's a very elegant way you can test for this, um, and those are these adoption studies. So you can take children that were separated from their biological parents at birth. They've never met them, right? And when they are very young, their IQ strongly correlates with the IQ of their adoptive parents, because they're massively influenced by their environment. But the older they become, the weaker this correlation gets, until at some point it basically disappears, but instead their IQ starts to more and more correlate with the IQ 
of their biological parents, which they've never met. This is one of the strongest kinds of evidence you can have for a heritability of intelligence. Now, how can you explain that a heritability increases? Um, there are different possibilities, and people don't really know, but one simple explanation is that, you know, your genes, they're not equally active throughout your life. Some play a larger role when you're very young, maybe even only an embryo, an embryo. Some play a more predominant role once you're very old. So it is not impossible that some of the genes that, you know, change your or affect your intelligence might play a larger role at a certain age. But there is another explanation which, which I find is way more interesting. As you go through life, consciously or unconsciously, you tend to choose an environment around you that best fits your personal traits. So if you're very small, you're probably not going to try to become a basketball player. If you're, if you're super introverted and agreeable, you won't, you're not so likely to try to become a policeman, and so on, right? So if you live your life properly, you will try to find environments or attract the environments that best fit to your personal genetic makeup by the choices that you make in life. And the older you get, the more of those choices you've had. That's why when you're very old, your genetics and your environment, they become harder to separate because they actually influence one another and they kind of merge. So what does this mean? Um, let's take maybe the 80% figure for now, right? What does it say? Does it say that you are only responsible for 20% of your stupid decisions? No, no, take responsibility. This is not what it means. Um, actually, it means the following. It means when I test a large group of people, 80% of the differences in IQ between people can be explained by genetics. This is not the same as to say that you individually are only responsible for 20% of your intelligence. No, no. Those are very different statements. One, one has to think about it for a bit, but this is, this is not the same. And, and this holds true for the very most complex tasks. There is no genetic test that with these complex, uh, complex traits could tell you where the limits of your individual potential are. So, I know I mean, people like to use genetics as an excuse, especially when they hear about heritability, but mostly that's simply wrong. The good and the bad news is that you can only find out on an individual level how far you can get by trying really hard. So, I know intelligence is a problematic topic, right? Especially the genetics of intelligence, because, you know, history has shown that there are enough weird people and ideologies that love to use genetics of intelligence to justify all kinds of stupid uh, kinds of discrimination, right? So, usually what geneticists do is just, they just don't talk about it. But, I don't think that this is a very smart strategy. Because the, the worst situation that you can end in is that only those people with a stupid agenda are talking about something that might be true, right? If it's true, you talk about it. There is, there is uh, even if it's problematic. Yeah, so, so here's a mantra for you guys, for everything that is true but maybe difficult. Never leave the truth to the assholes. <laughs> All right, we established there is intelligence. It is heritable to a certain degree. Um, can we change it genetically? So it's way harder to determine which genes are responsible for intelligence than whether it's heritable. Um, with, with the best studies that we have at this point, 
we've identified 336 positions in the genome that affect intelligence. But those 336 positions taken together can only explain 7% of the IQ differences between people. So we know there have to be way more, possibly thousands of gene positions. Um, and this basically means is that at this point, we don't have any tool that would allow us to change so much in the genome at once. This means that the situation that we're in is that we know there is a genetic component to intelligence, actually a quite significant role one, but there is nothing we can do about it. That's, that's what I want to say. So um, I want to go to another easy topic, um, which is, so actually it's about magic mushrooms. You know, it, okay, this, oh, the, well, this was a weird way to go from one slide to the other. So maybe I should, you know, my book is about optimization in general. Me being a geneticist, of course, I like to talk about genes a lot, but I also wanted to include more practical things that you can, you know, um, something that can actually be done at this point. Uh, and we all don't want to die and we all like to eat, so I thought this is interesting. There's actually um, psilocybin, the active component in magic mushrooms, um, you know, it was made illegal in the 60s and there was a lot of research back then. Then it kind of paused, it got very difficult, but now, within the last years, it tended to continue with, of course, way better methodology that, that we have now. Um, so there are uh, really cool studies published in the recent years um, concerning things that could be considered optimization in some definitions. For example, there are studies that Psilocybin sessions are one of the very few one-time interventions that increase openness over extended periods of time. Recently, there was a study that a psilocybin session can uh, increase creativity for about a week, but by far the most interesting kinds of studies are those concerning uh, psilocybin and the fear of death. Usually, uh, what those studies are doing is they take people that have a terminal diagnosis, terminal cancer or something, right? So they bring them into a room, uh, they tell them this everything up front, right? This is not, they just don't put them in a room and give them something. So they bring it in a room. Um, this is a very secure setting. There is trained personnel and then they give them a high dose of psilocybin and then whatever happens, happens, this whole trippy stuff. And so there the are a few interesting things they find. For example, uh, a majority of people reports that this was one of the top five most important experiences of their life, somewhere up there with marriage and birth of a child, etc. But what is most interesting to me, many of those claim that their fear of death decreased, and in some cases they even report it was gone. And it was always a big mystery, but not just at the moment, but for extended period of time. And it was always a big mystery, how do we explain this? Because you, know, you can't just talk to people that are taking mushrooms, because whatever they say it will sound very stupid. Um, but, you know, you can describe it with scientific language if you just take the data. And actually, there is a good hypothesis which recently emerged how this fear of death um, vanishes, basically. And there is something in your brain that is called the default mode network. It's called default mode network because this is what stays active if you put people into an fMRI and tell them to think about nothing. Um, it was fairly recently discovered, actually, and it's Oftentimes, it's referred to as the center of the self. You know, everything that you're conscious of, no matter how simple and trivial it is, has to be constructed somewhere in your brain, right? The fact that you and the floor are not the same, somewhere your brain has to come up with this idea. Of course, it's true, but it has to be built in the brain. And also, the idea that you are a separate individual moving through a universe that is not you, 
is something that the brain at some point has to construct. And this is what happens in this default mode network. It is where the autobiographical information is stored. It's where self-referencing takes place. So explaining who you are to yourself. It's where you're reflecting about your own emotions. It's where basically you can say it's where your ego is located in the brain. Now, people um, who were given those psychedelic substances, usually what they report is, um, you know, they see these intense colors, they hear these intense sounds, and they have these weird emotions, but things feel hyper real to them, right? Not dampened or numb, but the opposite, hyper real. So people always expect that, right, if we put them into a brain scan, there will just be a firework of neuronal activity, boom, but what they found was the very opposite. Almost all of the brain areas, the activity decreased. And one of those networks of regions is the default mode network. And the lower the activity gets, the more likely people are to claim that they have experienced what is mostly called ego dissolution. Here's what's, happen, what's happening in this state. The activity of the default mode network decreases and people lose the sense of being a self moving through the universe. That's, that's what they mean when they say uh, everything is one and all this uh, stuff that, you know, sounds super hippie esoteric, but basically it's the activity of these guys, of the, of the default mode network, okay? Um, so what they claim to witness is that they see what they consider to be the self, the I, disappear and nothing bad happens because consciousness, of course, stays present and can witness how the self disappears and people notice that it's not that bad. Okay, it's gone. What now? All right. Um, so at some point, of course, activity comes back and uh, this is why death and rebirth is a phrase so commonly used by people to describe what they subjectively uh, experienced, yeah? But some of them claim that for them this, uh, this kind of acted like a general rehearsal of their own death. And they thought it's okay. Um, yeah, that's why they lose it to a certain degree. And I find this so interesting because it's very different from how regular anxiolytic drugs work, which constantly have to numb the parts of your brain that evoke fear response. This works by changing the perspective once and then acts um, over an extended period of time. All right, so um, I want to give you something maybe more practical to end with, maybe something that doesn't put you in jail if you actually try it out. Um, and it's a very, it's a, it's a experiment that became very prominent in psychological literature. Some might have heard about it. Um, it's about, you know, so, so this is the setup. It's, it's called the bridge experiment, roughly speaking, because you have two different bridges. And again, this is something that edges on optimization, if you want to interpret it like this. You have two bridges. One bridge, the lower one in this case, is super stable. It's super safe. It's not very high up. There is a nice little river sneaking below it. And then there is another bridge and it's the total opposite. This is a scary bridge. It's high up in the air. It's shaking in the wind. It doesn't look very stable. It goes down far to pointy rocks. It's a bridge where you want to shit yourself. So, at the end of both of those bridges, there's an experimentator standing. And this experimentator is actually a very attractive woman. Now, whenever a, a guy, a man, um, crosses one of those bridges, the experimentator hands them a sheet, say, hey, we're doing a study, do you want to fill this out? Yeah, thank you. And once they're done, she hands him a telephone number and say, yeah, if you have some questions regarding the study, call me, right? So here's what happens. Of the people who crossed the safe bridge, 13% of the guys gave her a call. 
the people who crossed the terrifying bridge, 50% called the lady. What is happening? This is, this is what, you, uh, what is usually referred to as misattribution of arousal. And, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, so basically uh, it's explained like this. Um, usually when we think we, we get into a situation, we first notice the situation, we notice whether it's threatening or not, and then we develop these bodily symptoms like shaky hands, sweaty palms, a feeling of inner tension and so on, but actually the causality is different. What is happening is you get into a situation, your body responds with certain bodily symptoms, shaking, sweaty, etc., and then your brain interprets, ah, okay, apparently this is a very scary situation. Now, what can happen is that you are in two situations at the same time where both of those situations evoke the same bodily response. For example, if you're on a bridge that is very scary or if you see an experimentator that looks super hot. Both of these can make you know, your palms sweaty, inner tension, elevated heart rate and so on. And in this case, your brain has problems separating those emotions from one another and interprets part of the fear from the bridge to be evoked by the attractivity of the person. So there were many follow-up studies on this. So for example, this uh, also works when you put people into roller coasters and afterwards they should um, check on a computer how attractive they find certain people. There was a study published recently in Vienna where they've shown that even arousing music can have this effect. And, uh, and uh, this is fairly interesting, I think, because it would explain something that is not very intuitive, in my opinion. And this is why sometimes people like to, uh, to do their first date in a horror movie. Why would you do this? You would, you would expect that if you take someone on a date, you want to evoke as many positive emotions in them as possible and not look stupid monster getting shot. Or, but, but this would explain it to a certain degree, right? Because if, you're, if you have this, this basically it's, it's a form of anxiety response, it can subjectively increase the attractivity of another person. But be careful, guys. If you're super ugly, If you're so unattractive that people start to sweat and shake when they see you, this gets enhanced too. So if, if you're not attractive to the person to begin with, they consider you even more unattractive. So <laughs> basically what I want to tell you is that you maybe shouldn't go see a very exciting movie such as Lord of the Rings if you yourself look like an orc. Thank you. You sexy motherfucker.